The first reading, a reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Doom for the shepherds who allow the flock of my pasture to be destroyed and scattered. It is the Lord who speaks. This, therefore, is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the shepherds in charge of my people. He have let my flock be scattered and go wandering and have not taken care of them. Right. I will take care of you for your misdeeds. It is the Lord who speaks. But the remnant of my flock I myself will gather from all the countries where I have dispersed them and will bring them back to their pastures. They shall be fruitful and increase in numbers. I will raise up shepherds to look after them and pasture them. No fear nor terror for them any more. Not one shall be lost. It is the Lord who speaks. See, the days are coming. It is the Lord who speaks. When I will raise a virtuous branch for David, who will reign as true king and be wise, practicing honesty and integrity in the land. In his days Judah will be safe, and Israel dwell in confidence. And this is the name he will be called, the Lord our integrity. The word of the Lord. In the midst of the misfortunes and afflictions which were about to engulf his people, afflictions and misfortunes brought on them, especially by their religious and civic leaders. Jeremiah had words of consolation and encouragement. Bright and happy days were in store for them. Some would return from the exile and live in peace in their homeland under more God-fearing leaders. But it is to the mess uh, Messianic age, to Christ's day, that thoughts of the prophet were especially turned. The great day would come when the new chosen people would have a king who would be justice itself, a king to keep them loyal to God, a shepherd to care for their real interests. As Psalms 22 puts, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He guides me along the right path. He is true to his name. In the Lord's own how shall I dwell forever and ever. Both Jeremiah and the psalmist were looking into the future and beheld the coming of Christ and the age of a new chosen people. That these are messianic prophecies is clear from the fact that our divine Lord himself appealed the title of true, true shepherd to himself. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows, me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for my sheep. We today indeed are fortunate to be living in Christ, the Christian era. We have seen the messianic prophecies fulfilled. We know that Christ has come and changed our world. We know that we are the sheep of his chosen flock, the members, indeed, of his mystical body. We know that he has put us on the right path, on the road to heaven, and that as faithful shepherd, he is ever watching over us, moving us on when we are inclined to nibble at the forbidden grass by the roadside, bringing us back on his own shoulders when we stray from the path and get caught up in the briars and uh, brambles of earthly attractions. We Christians know all of this, but we, do we really appreciate what the good God has done for us? By sending his Son on earth as men, he made us heirs to heaven, brothers of Christ, and adopted sons of himself. Heaven is now our destination, our only real purpose in life. Everything else is absolutely secondary and only of transitory importance, yet how many there are so armed who let these things of secondary importance get such a hold on them that they forget or ignore their wants and only purpose in life? They allow the transitory things of this life to hold them back from reaching the endless life of heaven. To help us to see the utter folly of such Christians, let us suppose for a moment 
and a poor man who had a great desire to go to Lourdes. He was given a free ticket with all expenses paid. He set out joyfully, safe from Chicago. His first thought was New York. Here he became enchanted with the hustle and bustles of the great city's life. He visited many movie pictures and stage productions and spent so much time that he missed the pilgrim ship for which he was booked. He had not enough to pay for a ticket to Europe on another ship and so he missing Lourdes. He ended up his days in misery in New York, no longer enchanted by his extractions but driven to despair by the utter emptiness of what it had to offer. That, that man's fate was but a shadow of irreparable loss of the Christian who lets the attractions of this world keep him from heaven. He may find his days, his mind, and his hands full of interesting worldly affairs, but he should realize that every time the clock strikes, he is an hour nearer to his earthly end. After that, what is there for him? What explanation can he offer when he arrives empty-handed and totally unprepared at the judgment seat? He cannot plead ignorance. He cannot plead lack of time. He could have pro profit provided for all of his earthly needs, while providing at the same time for his eternal future. He allowed himself to get so immersed in the things of this world that he gave no thought to his future. It has happened before and it will happen again. It can happen to us unless we frequently take a good look at our way of living and honestly and sincerely measure our daily doing by the standard of the gospel. If frequently during life we judge ourselves and our actions with all sincerity, we need not fear the judgment, the judgment of the dead. Um, the second reading, a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. In Jesus Christ, you that used to be so far apart from us have been brought very close by the blood of Christ, for he is the peace between us, and has made the two into one, and broken down the barrier which used to keep them apart, actually destroying in his own person the hostility caused by the rules and decrees of the law. This was to create one single new man in himself, out of the two of them, and by restoring peace through the cross, to unite them both in a single body and reconcile them with God. In his own person, he killed the hostility. Later, he came to bring the good news of peace. Peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near at hand. Through him, both of us have in the one spirit our way to come to the Father. The word of the Lord. He came and preached peace. In these five words, St. Paul sums up the mystery of Christ on earth. He preached peace. He laid down the foundations of peace. He reconciled men with God, their Creator and Father, and reconciled men with one another. He taught men to be brotherly toward one another. When questioned by one of the Pharisees to which was the most importance of the commandments, he answered, Love God with all your heart, all your strength, all your mind, and all and your neighbor as yourself. The two together are the essence of true religion. On these two depends the whole law of and the prophets. Long before Christ came on earth, the prophets had described the kingdom which he was to establish as a kingdom of peace. He was called the Prince of Peace. In his kingdom, there would never again be war. Men would turn their swords into uh, plowshares, their spears into sickles. Nation will not leave sword against nation. There will be no more training for war. 
These prophecies, however, were not fulfilled in the kingdom that Christ set up on this earth. Nor was that intended. The prophets were speaking of the final kingdom, the completion of Christ's work in heaven. There, the perfect peace will prevail. There, man will truly love his fellow men, and all men will love God. Christ did lay the foundation for peace between men and between nations over even on this earth. He made us all his brothers. He made all men, no matter what their race or color, God's adopted sons and therefore members of the one family. But we must not forget that while Christ laid solid and few secure foundations, the walls of the building were to build of mortal, fallible men who could abuse the gift of free will with which they were endowed. If all men kept the two great commandments, loving God with all their heart and loving their neighbor as themselves, peace would naturally follow. Such an, such an if, however, is a capital if, um, for unfortunately there will always be among us those who will fail to keep these basic commandments to the letter, and therefore there will always be a violation of peace. While we regret that even our fellow Christians can and do break these commandments and act contrary to the teaching of their faith, we must not be scandalized at this, nor must we say that Christ's teaching has failed. Christ laid the foundation for peace. He encouraged his followers to live in peace. He wished them this peace, but even Christ could not force man's free will. He being God foresaw that the Christian peace uh, we should reign in our world would be broken many times. Yet, forgiveness was ever available to those who failed to keep his law. And his grace and divine assistance were there to help all who suffered because of the violation of his law. There will always be someone who will be a menace and a threat to peace because they have forgotten that God is their father. Um, consequently, they do not look on their neighbor as their brother. There is still a majority of God-loving and neighbor-loving men and women among us, not only in the Christian church but outside of it also, who want peace. It is up to them to make their voices heard before God first of all in their daily fervent prayers for peace and then also in the councils of state where human decisions are taken. We can all do more for the uh, preservation of peace on earth than perhaps we realize. All true lovers of God and neighbor should instill the same love in their children so that they will grow up inspired and by respect for the two greatest commandments. Um, there will be peace lovers in our streets, in our town, in our country. By word, by example, and by prayer, we can do much to spread love for the peace which flows from love of neighbor and love of God. If we turn our protest marches, which so often are not inspired by true love of peace, into prayer marches, we might see better results. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Said Tennyson long ago, he was but repeating what Christ had said centuries before, us and you shall receive peace in one's conscience, and peace in one's home, peace with one's neighbor. Peace between nations is one of the noblest causes to which can one can dedicate one's energies and prayers. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The apostles rejoined Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. Then he said to them, You must come you must come away to some lonely place all by yourself and rest for a while. For there were so many coming and going that the apostles had no time even to eat. So they went off in a boat 
to a lonely place where they could be by themselves. But people saw them going, and many could guess where. And from every town they all hurried to the place on foot and reached it before them. So as he stepped ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he took pity on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he set himself to teach them at some length. The Gospel of the Lord. In these days, um, in these few verses, St. Mark very strongly brings out the compassion, the human understanding of Jesus for man. He first planned to give his apostles a well-earned rest. They have evidently worked hard while out on their mission, and a few days' rest would restore their lost energy. He himself too must have been hard-pressed, preaching and dealing with the crowds. In the absence of the apostles, he had no one to help him. He too needed a rest. He therefore planned that he and they should go to a quiet corner of the Sea of Galilee, where there was no village and where therefore they would not be disturbed. The desire of the crowds, however, to see him and to hear him speak upset these plans. The people got to the quiet spot first. There they were waiting when the boat pulled to the shore. He could have sent them away, but again his human compassion took over. Seeing these simple people of Galilee so anxious to hear about God and his mercy, he let them stay and began to preach the good news of forgiveness and hope to them. For the most part, they were simple, unlettered villagers, shepherds, fishermen. They knew a little about the law of Moses, but only a little. There was no one but the local rabbi to teach them, and the local rabbis were not very educated at that time. The doctors of the law, the great theologians, were all in Jerusalem, where they got the respect and financial reward which they felt they merited. Hence, the people of the country were more, were more or less forgotten and neglected. They were, as how the Lord described them, like sheep without a shepherd, wandering about half lost. They were certainly fortunate, however, in finding the true shepherd who would lead them to eternal pastures. Not only would he now sacrifice his race to come to their aid, but he would later on lay down his life for them and for all of us. We, like those poor people of Galilee, have so much to be grateful for. The compassionate Christ has had pity on us too and has brought us into his fall. He knows our infirmities and all our human weaknesses. He is ever ready to have pity on us and pardon us. Those people of Galilee were not saints. They were ordinary, run-of-the-mill, not of a religious people. They cheated one another. They were often uncharitable to one another. They were not always chaste and pure, they prayed very little and perhaps only when they wanted some material benefit. Yet our Lord had compassion on them. This should give us great confidence, great encouragement. Christ has not changed, He is the same yesterday, today and forever. And He has the same compassion for us that He had for those Galileans. We too are often like sheep without a shepherd, wandering half lost through life. He is ever calling us to come to Himself so that He will lead us to safe pastures. If only we would listen to His merciful call. Today, today's Gospel is one such call. It goes out to every member of this congregation who has been legs in his or her religious life up to now. Christ wants us back on the high road to heaven. All we have to do is to break with the past, with the earthly things that kept us from God. We can set out as free men to follow Christ. He has left to his church the holy sacrament of penance in which he guarantees us complete and entirely remission of all past sins if we confess them with true sorrow. 
Let us not think that our sins are too big to be forgiven, that Christ could, uh, could not have compassion on us because of our dreadful past. We can remember those Galileans, many of them were sinners, as we are, and he had compassion on them. He, come, he came to call sinners, he tells us. Let us answer his call today. Tomorrow might be too late.